I have uh, pasted a link into the chat. I'll just do it again. This is the link to our Herrig webpage, the Harper Adams R Users Group webpage. If any of you like hex stickers for your laptops, I have uh, the brand new 2024 ones hot off the presses. You can just grab one from my office anytime. Uh, maybe I'll remember to put some out on my front door and you can just grab them in passing if you want one. I have a schedule, which uh, if you're on the email list, you would have seen this uh, schedule. And I'm just planning for the next several weeks to go through the uh, boot camp sections. And um, sections one through six are all about R programming, about the R programming language and the basic nuts and bolts. And uh, as I've mentioned before, we have one or two people that um, I think are first uh, time joiners today. Uh, these sessions are are designed for people that have never used R and maybe need a refresher on stats. So starting quite slow and then we can move faster if people want. So give me some feedback and we will um, accommodate everybody. Notice there are a couple of weeks when there will be no meeting. I'll be in South Africa for these meetings and then I'll be back and we'll do the sixth um, one. And if you just scroll down a little bit, we have links to uh, a lot of previous meetings. Um, the YouTube links work for most of them. And uh, any assets, files, scripts, data sets that were used as examples are there too. Some people use these, not a, not a huge amount. I don't edit the YouTube videos, so they're, they're not slick in production quality like a lecture or a real YouTube channel, but they're there just as a resource in case you missed and want to uh, participate in case it's a topic you really are interested in. Um, now, most of you know that uh, there's a separate site for the RStats Bootcamp, which is the material we're going through. We're on um, the RStats Bootcamp session two today, and I have some slides that are linked here and a link to the, the Bootcamp. If you um open that link it'll take you to this page just post paste that in maybe i'll just close the other one maybe, maybe i'll do it this way that i'll open this link in a new tab oops <clears throat> there we go so we have the link open in a new tab now um, but i'm just going to go back to start with because as usual i'm going to start with um, an introduction by way of some slides, and I'll pause to show some code along the way. So uh, if you'd like to follow along with that, you can just click the link. It should download the PowerPoint slides. I'm just testing it on my own computer. Make sure that it all works. It seems to be OK. And I'm going to share the screen, start my laser pointer. Uh, does anyone have anything to um, to say or questions, comments, proclamations, or other announcements before we begin? Otherwise, I'm going to go to the lecture. You can raise your hand. Um, I'll try to watch the chat during the lecture. It's very informal here. We're all friends. And I'll say once again, as I did the last lecture, that the, um, the connotation of the boot camp is it's a friendly boot camp. It's in the spirit of um, doing something together as a team, hopefully something fun, uh, as opposed to weeding out the weaklings. It's not that kind of boot camp. So I just want to clarify that for everyone. OK, if there are no questions. Let's begin. I explained and Matt just mentioned the, um, the rubber ducking. So, uh, you know, I like a good metaphor. I'll use them a lot. I'll start today's session with a metaphor just for today's session in a moment. But um, the rubber duck, it is a metaphor for uh, a good friend that you can break down a complex problem and, and talk to them about it. And it is very useful. And I, I made this um, this image for this run of the boot camp. Uh, for that reason, so let's remember the uh, the rubber duck, and I'll uh, he'll come up in in the slides today, and I'll I'll keep bringing it up because it's very useful uh, to keep in mind, especially when you're getting frustrated with code. 
right. Um, the metaphor I want to introduce first today is uh, the R language as a passive aggressive butler. Oftentimes when we're learning a computing language, especially if you haven't um, had any formal training or not very much, um, it can be frustrating. And famously, the learning curve is pretty steep uh, for R and for other languages if you're, if you're not trained as a coder. What do I mean by R being a passive aggressive butler? What I mean is that um, when we're thinking of designing the way that we speak to R, with the R language, uh, we have to be a little careful. Uh, R can be very powerful as an ally, it can be uh, very useful, can do things that are very inconvenient to do otherwise. But uh, if, we, if we're if we careless with our phrasing, we might not get exactly what we want uh, out, of, out of the R language. So in that sense, um, R can be a great friend, but we have to be a little careful with the way we speak to it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, for uh, this bootcamp page, we are going to have a few um, objectives. One is we're going to go through an example script and we're going to set it up in a very particular way. Now, there are an infinite number of ways that you can set up an R script for reproducible coding. We'll talk about reproducible coding more in the weeks to come. But um, this way that I'm going to talk about today is, is a way that um, I suggest you start. It, it is a, um, a means to develop good habits early on that just make it easier to learn. This is, this is not just my opinion, but it's my observation of people learning R for many years and um, helping them to learn R for many years. So I've got an example script and I'm going to go through some simple techniques like making comments in your script, um, a very brief blast on how to find help, and we'll revisit this simple tool over and over in the weeks to come. And then the idea of pseudocode. If you haven't heard of pseudocode, I'll just briefly introduce the idea. We're going to talk about uh, in the R programming language math operators, uh, what the, the basic ones are, how they operate, what R expects, what you know, what your part of the deal is, and so forth. Um, now, there's something called a Boolean operator, a Boolean. Has anyone um, ever not heard of Boolean? Say yes in the chat if you've heard of Boolean, and maybe no if you haven't heard of uh, a Boolean before. Yes or no in the chat, please. Just a a micro um, a micro survey. No, okay. I see a couple of no's and some please explains. Okay, just more no's than yeses. Okay, so um, we'll I'll introduce and completely explain the topic, and we'll have even if we have time at the end an exercise. Uh, there are exercises at the end of every bootcamp page. Uh, I think it's hard to do it in the one hour that we have to get to the exercises, but it's a it's a good little bit of um, light and hopefully not unpleasant homework between these sessions. But a Boolean is is just a kind of data that uh, takes on the value of true and false, yes or no, one or zero. There, all of those things I just said are equivalent in uh, Boolean logic, and uh, we use logical phrases. Now, they're kind of fun. They're a little bit like a puzzle. So we use these um, these values of yes or no, true or false, in um, statements that are logical, like uh, a simple logical statement is uh, five greater than three. Well, uh, five is greater than three. So in Boolean logic, the logical statement five greater than three assumes the value of true. So that's how it works, and we'll give some more examples um, today. Um, a thing that is, I think, rather important, especially when you're beginning, is this concept uh, that there are two versions of the R programming language out there. Um, I was speaking to someone who's been, who's actually quite a good R programmer and uh, quite a good um, uh, learning statistician as well the other day. And uh, we were talking about it, and I mentioned something about the tidyverse. They had not heard of this, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what the tidyverse is and how it differs from base R. 
and why it's a challenge that uh, we have to contend with and you should be aware of it. So there are two versions of the R language. The base R version is um, the version we all, if you've been using R for some years, it's the version you would have learned. And a um, little, little less than 10 years ago, the tidyverse version of R came out and uh, became very popular. But today, the challenge is that um, the dialects of programming in each of the versions are very different. And um, there are extra requirements, extra utilities, but also extra requirements for using tidyverse. Uh, some people religiously uh, love the tidyverse and some people religiously reject it. To me, they're both just tools. And I uh, just want to tell you a little bit about both of them, mostly today that they exist, and uh, my thoughts on them. And then the practice exercises at the end, just like every week. OK, so um, <clears throat> I want to demonstrate first uh, what a script is. Um, and I'm going to show you a beginning script. It's all set up with uh, just the few basic parts that we need that comprises a, a real working script. And um, as you work through this and all the other um, boot camp pages, I just wanted to remind you best practice. Uh, I intend these boot camp pages to be a um, self-driven exercise so you can dip in and dip out of. It's quite hard to learn that way, though. Uh, often it's the only way that, that people can forge time in their busy calendars to learn. But I expect uh, as you read through the boot camp, that you code along with it. Some people I've observed in the past, uh, some um, master students, I don't see if I, I don't spy any of them in the chat today, um, but they may be here. Um, they uh, they will read the, they reported back that they read the boot camp on their phone. And I uh, don't intend it to be used on the phone. I, I, I wish I could, but you can't code at the same time as you merely read the pages. I saw a hand go up just briefly. Is is there a, a comment or a question? Maybe it was maybe it was um, unintentional. If there is, just unmute yourself and uh, yell out or put something in the chat or just raise your hand. I'll try to pay attention. But if people can watch the chat too and help me with that, I would appreciate that. Um, so anyway, I, I intend that you code while you go through the bootcamp pages. You can read the pages in about 30 minutes, but I think it will take you um, at least another 30 minutes or an hour if you actually type the code and run it yourself. At least run it. You could copy and paste your code, but I, I advise to type it. Why do I advise you to type it? Because that's tedious and I've already given you the, the code there. The reason is that if you copy and paste my code, it will run perfectly and it will be beautifully formatted and you will learn almost nothing by copying and pasting it. But if you if you type, just take this 30 minutes or so that it takes to type as much as you could take in one setting, maybe over lunch and type it yourself. You will make mistakes and you will learn from those mistakes. So uh, hence the advice to type your own code. Uh, and then finally, um, while you're typing, you'll notice that I sprinkle what I call comments. I'll explain how to do that and what I mean by that in just a moment. But um, I strongly advise, I recommend greatly to document your own code with comments that are notes to yourself to explain what you're learning, what you're doing, and why you've done it that way. So this is uh, best practice for any coding, but it's particularly important I've noticed for learning R. Right, so if you want to code along, even in the lecture today, or at least just play around, you may. Um, I'm just going to tab out of um, of the slides for just a moment, and I'm going to go over to the, the boot camp page two. And if you missed it before. Oh, OK, uh, Dan, thank you for letting me know. Um, you're welcome to be here. I've just pasted the uh, link uh, in the um, 
uh, in the chat again for this web page. And if you just scroll down, I, I, my slides more or less follow the the um, <clears throat> order of the web page. And I'm I'm just here at example 2.1, an example script. So I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger so that it's easier to read in the chat. And I'm just going to encourage you, if you want to um, come along with me, to download that. And uh, all being well, your computer, you can see me mousing over the top here, part up here. I'm just going to um, click on that file, and it should open it right up in our studio for me. And it certainly does. Now, last week, we installed R in our studio, and um, we took a tour of our studio. And um, I'm just going to make the text a little bit bigger so that it's easy for people to see. Now, this whole script has um, a few parts. And um, I'm just going to go back to my slides now. And we'll come back to the, um, the script <clears throat> when we need to. So uh, the first part of the script contains a header, and it's these lines of code. And uh, if, if I haven't said it already, I think I may not have um, any line of R code that uh, begins with a single hash is a comment, and it isn't treated as code by uh, RStudio. We can see that with the color coding uh, in our studio is that these commented lines are all colored blue and the single line of code that I have that is actual code, a function, the help function with a starting bracket and an ending bracket and uh, the word mean inside the brackets, the single line of code that's recognized is uh, in white. And um, I explained last time that I, I have set my color schemes to my preference, but the default will be a white background and different colored text. So uh, you can um, you can edit those preferences yourself. And if you need help doing that, um, one of us or, or I can help um, towards the end of the session today. All right, so this header is just all commented lines and the function of the header is uh, just to document in this script as a living document for what you're going to do in the script, uh, who you are, what you're going to use this script for. And I like to put the last date edited. I'm just going to go ahead and um, fill this out myself. I recommend for every script that you do the same. I like to use the um, um, ISO 8601 date format. If you haven't heard of that, it's the uh, universal format the computers recognize, and it's very convenient because it it sorts itself on computer operating systems um, just just right. <clears throat> so that's the format: the year, two-digit month, and two-digit day, separated by dashes. So the first section is the header. Um, notice that the um, the syntax for these comments. I've got actually two hashes at the beginning of each line. Uh, I only need one to make it a comment. Uh, I could put a comment in here uh, and go to the beginning of that line and put a a single hash mark, and that that line seven now becomes a comment. But up here, I've used um, just a little personal style. I've put two hash marks just as a visual cue that this is a, a structural comment in my script. And I've put four hash marks at the end of this and some text in the middle. And this structure of having at least one um, hash mark in the beginning of a line and four at the end has a, a structural function. You see, there's a little drop down button here in our studio, and it makes this four hash ended line of a comment makes this um, section a foldable uh, chunk. So the, the technical word in the R uh, and R Studio world for, for this 
amount of code that I have selected here is a chunk. It's not just a descriptive word. It's it's a technical word for uh, what is referred to. And uh, it's functional because we can fold our code and see the structure of a whole script. Um, now, with this very simple script, we're not gaining a, a huge amount, but you can see we see the major sections of the script this way. And when we open it up, it's it's harder to take in, even with a short script. And there's another structural trick that I'll just show you real quick. If I make this window bigger, if I mouse over this little hamburger menu over here, it's like an offset hamburger menu with some horizontal gray lines, and I click it, creates a visual clickable table of contents that will move our cursor. If I click on the header, it moves my cursor to the header. If I click on contents, it moves my cursor to the contents. If I click on um, this uh, two example, I've just copied this content, this uh, contents entry down to be a, um, a code chunk that is that number two example. So it creates a navigation pane for us. So the syntax has function. And uh, that's the main message I want to give you about these comments. They provide extra information. They do provide a function. And while we're on a tour of uh, utilities, uh, one clickable menu, uh, this takes up space in your window. Some people don't like it. In fact, I don't like it very much. And if I do have a very long script, um, I often use a second way to navigate my scripts. It's down here at the bottom. There's a little gold hash sign that names the chunk our cursor's in. Watch, and if I click into the contents, it change to, changes to the contents chunk. And if I click on that, it also is a pop-up menu of a clickable table of contents. OK, so I'm going to go back to the slides now. <clears throat> And that's the function of um, of the header. And I've explained the uh, the contents, at least I've displayed it um, to you and demonstrated it to you. But let me explain it a little bit more. Is that the contents section, I, I like to put a formal contents section right in the top of my scripts. If you're doing even a simple analysis, you're going to have a code chunk. I would have a code chunk that uh, does my environment setup, reads in my data and um, stuff like that. And then I might have a code chunk that graphs my data for a single test, possibly. And then I might have another chunk that um, performs a statistical test. That would be the structure of a simple script. And uh, I would have content entries for all of those. Now, typically, even with simple data sets, even simple experiments, you might have several graphs and several stats tests, maybe testing the assumptions and stuff like that. So it becomes a uh, an important thing, especially if somebody else is going to help you and is going to collaborate with you on that script. Um, contents are very useful, essential, I would even say. So contents lend organization to your script and give a give a hats off to the code chunks that are going to come below. Now, um, I put this in to remind myself to define what a chunk is. So uh, just to be reiterated again, uh, any line of code that starts with at least one uh, hash mark and ends with at least four in the default R Studio setup with some text in between those um, those hashes becomes a code chunk. Uh, and it, it provides that navigation function like I demonstrated. Now, um, <clears throat> while you're while you're learning, um, like one extreme way to learn anything is to completely have everything in your mind so that you have full confidence using some tool or um, technique that you want to master. But almost nobody learns that way. M most people learn on the job, so to speak. You have a, if you're learning how to use a tool, you have a use for it already, and you learn to use the tool while you make use of it. And uh, that's the best way to learn um, many, many kinds of skills. And R is no different. And almost everybody that I've ever met has learned R in that way. 
they have some problem they want to solve and they've learned while they're solving their problem and you continue to learn. Well, um, if you learn that way, you're going to need help. And there are many ways to get help programming with R. These days, the commonest way is to Google for help. Um, I, I feel I must say that when I personally began to use R, um, Google did exist. So it wasn't that long ago, but it was quite long ago and Google wasn't uh, like it is today. And the R community was much, much smaller. And um, Googling really wasn't an option for help. There was uh, one message board, the R official message boards, where people would post and give and receive help uh, that I used an awful lot. But back then, the best help and the designers of R realized that, uh, in fact, they, they, as we talked about last week, they designed the whole language for, for beginners, for people that never coded and people that were not expert statisticians. Uh, so they built in a fantastic help system. It's fantastic, I say, but it uh, requires some orientation to get the most out of it. And so the way that you use help, the, the most straightforward way, is to use the help function. All functions, uh, we'll have a session on functions maybe next week or the week after, but um, all functions are defined by the function name. The name of the help function often connotes um, what it does. So uh, this function, it does work for you. What does it do? The help function helps you. It gets the help pages. And uh, all function names um, are bounded by brackets. And inside the bracket, uh, if we're using the help function, we put the name of another function if we want help with that function. And then this is just an example. We'll talk about all of this stuff before. I don't expect you to know that th this is a, a function yet. <clears throat> but um, I do want to tell you about how to use the help. The mean is the name of another function. Uh, guess what it does? It calculates the mean of some numeric variables. I think we already used it last week. And if I go over to my um, to my uh, page here, you can see I've got it waiting for you. But I'm going to slip back. And uh, if you use this and execute the um, the help function in R, you'll get a page that looks like this. Um, there's a bigger picture of this um, on the the boot camp page. But uh, I've I've listed these sections on the boot camp page with explanations of what they are. And these are the useful parts of the help menu that it is worth learning about. I know that it looks daunting because it's just a bunch of text with no images, but it's built right into R and it's made to help you. And every function help page is set up in exactly the same way. And uh, even though I've used R for many years and I'm, I'm pretty good at using it now, uh, I still use the help functionality, the help pages almost every time that I use R, just to remind me of uh, what is required by certain functions and so forth. And it makes me faster as well, and it will for you as well. So every single help page has got the name of the function, and it's got the, uh, in brackets, the, um, the library that the function came from. It's got a name of it. It's got a description. That's the, th the three. Four, it tells you um, what the code looks like when you use it. And five, it tells you what the arguments are. I'm just going to slide over to um, to R. I'm going to make my window bigger. As you see, there's the help tab here. Right now we're on the files tab. And I'm going to um, just uh, make this a little bit bigger so that it's easier to see. And uh, remember how we submit code? Um, you can you can either push the run button, which I'm mousing over, and it'll run the line your cursor is on, or I'm just going to use Control Enter on Windows or um, Command Return on Macs to uh, submit it. And what will happen is the help page will pop up over here in this uh, lower right window. Three, two, one. There we go. So we see the name of the um, the library is Base. Um, that's the um, base library that has all sorts of functions that are useful in R, including 
the function mean to calculate the arithmetic mean and in, including the help function. Um, we have the description, just does a gener generic calculation for the, um, the arithmetic mean. Um, how to use it. Now there are two lines here to pay attention to. Usually we use um, the code with the top one, that's the minimal usage, and the dot, dot, dot implies there are some defaults. And uh, then down below, it shows you what the different default values are in case that matters to you. For basic use though, you'll just stick up here. It just shows you what you need. Now it says we're going to perform mean on X. What is X? Uh, you often need to know uh, what kind of data the passive aggressive Butler expects from you. And that's where this last section comes from, arguments. And it will tell us what the X is and what is expected. So it's an R object. Um, it's a it's a vector and other kinds of vector data. So it's just a vector of numbers usually. Down at the bottom, um, there are references, academic references, if you want to read up on something, if it's real important. But what's often useful is some examples. So uh, it, we can run the examples. As a matter of fact, if we click here, I'm not going to do that. This is a new feature of um, of R is uh, you can you can click out of our studio locally and run the examples in a virtual environment. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to paste these um, over here. What this is doing is it's it's uh, telling R to create a vector. We're combining with the C function the numbers, the integers zero through ten, and the integer fifty. So there should be uh, 12 integers in the vector X. I'm just going to submit line 22, 3, 2, 1. The only thing that happened down, down below is it echoed the command that I did. Now I'm just going to select X just to print out what the content of X is now, 3, 2, 1. And it's those integers 0 to 10 plus 50 at the end. And uh, we're going to calculate the mean of X and put it in a value called XM. Keep your eye down here in the console. See what happens. Three, two, one. We've calculated it, but it hasn't told us what XM is. Well, we didn't ask the butler to tell us what XM is. If we if we select our new variable X mean XM and we submit it three, two, one. The mean is eight point seven five. Um, and then finally, we can um, combine the values of our raw XM, and then they've th these examples are often very terse, which means that they're they require a little more work than a baby example to get the most out of them. And it, it does help me even uh, after these years of using R. Sometimes I have to think about what code is given to me as an example, but it is often very very useful. So here what they're doing is they're demonstrating what the trim argument, it's one of the other arguments they mentioned up here, um, does. We can read about what trim is, and it's, it, it is removing excessive values from your calculation. And if we trim um, here um, uh, a value of uh, 0.1, it says it, it wants a value of 0 to 0.5, just by way of example, 3, 2, 1. When that extreme value of 50 is removed, the mean is 5.5. We're not going to um, wait, spend more time talking about this because we'll have lots of time to play with them in the morning. That was really just to demonstrate the help function and what you can get out of the help pages. And we'll practice using them in the future. I mentioned. Um, the phrase pseudocode and uh, what pseudocode is <clears throat> is uh, it's relevant for this metaphor of telling it to the the rubber duck but it's a practice of um, breaking a problem down into smaller chunks and when you're learning a uh, actually this applies i i use pseudocode almost daily when i do coding problems if i come across a problem that is um, complex has more than a couple of steps it often helps to break that problem down into little steps 
smaller steps. Maybe, maybe I have a problem that I know how to, it requires five steps and uh, I know how to do four of the steps, but not a fifth one. Just by breaking it down logically, I can knock out the four steps I know how to do and then focus on, okay, now what do I really need here? Um, this helps with understanding. You can you can pretend you're talking to the rubber duck if if you like to do things that way. But just by way of um, of um, of giving an example, I think I'm just going to give a a verbal example um, for the sake of time. Is uh, what what if we were going to calculate the mean of a variable in an Excel spreadsheet and uh, and, and make a graph from that? And it was a summary of some data that you collected. I know maybe it was something like the um, the weight of individual potatoes uh, that are harvested, you know, at the at the end of the potato season. Well, um, to do that, we would have to go through one step of reading in the data into R. We would have to go to another step of um, possibly uh, graphing the data maybe making a box plot, or maybe make, looking at a histogram, a frequency distribution or a histogram uh, of it, and we would need to use the mean function to calculate the mean. And those are our three steps um, for it. And, it. and it can be something very complicated. Uh, often we have to do more complicated things than the example I just gave, but it's a very useful one. The pseudocode, by the way, will often comprise those um, code chunks that you do, and you can have sub code chunks in your big sections as well. So uh, we will also practice that in coming weeks. OK, so um, this this phrase math operators, this is a computer coding phrase and uh, you know R uses this coding language. Uh, R is both a piece of software. This, sometimes this distinction is not clear. I haven't emphasized it before, so I'll just say it verbally now. R is uh, a piece of software itself, um, and, it, and it's different than the piece of software called R Studio. So R is a piece of software that um, interprets code, and the code that it interprets is also called R. It's the R programming language. <clears throat> Well, um, the uh, so that's that's sort of three things. Uh, there's the the uh, R software, the R coding language, and R Studio as a um, an environment for us to use R in. Well, when we when we perform math in uh, in a computer programming language, we use uh, symbols to represent addition, subtraction. Now, th these are easy, a plus and a minus sign. This is the same way we write these things. For multiplication, we use, um, now some people might call this a star, but I would call this an asterisk, uh, like, like this in the chat. And uh, this is a forward slash, that's for division. And uh, what would people call this? What would people call this symbol that I'm um, showing with my cursor? You can just put it in the chat if you have a name for this. What do you call this? The the hat, okay. A couple of votes for hat. I've, I've usually called it the little hat, uh, but some people, yeah, okay, yes, the carrot is what I would call it. Um, so there are a few names for it. This is the uh, the symbol for exponent. So we need to learn these. There are some others, but we don't need to go uh, exhaustive with them now. So we can add things together and subtract things together with plus and minus. I'm just going to demonstrate a few of them. So uh, you know, 10 minus 5. Look down in the uh, console, and you can see it spit out with the number 3, 2, 1. We can use R just like a calculator in this fashion. Uh, we could divide. Um, you know, quite big numbers. <clears throat> uh, three, two, one, um, like this, and we can use exponents. So uh, three um, raised to the power of uh, four, three, two, one. There we go. 
So um, we can construct these phrases just like a calculator um, in steps. So that's one way to use R. We're not using any functions to do anything. That way, we're just spelling out the math. That's helpful to keep in mind. So it's a different way to use R, and we often do do it. Now, I um, I say to uh, try a few of these things, and this is talking about the order of operation. So we need to think about, just like we do when we learned uh, maths in school, the uh, order of operation. For this, I'm just going to go to the web page and um, scroll down to the math operators and um, just grab a couple of these. I'm not following my own advice um, just for the sake of time, but I guess I already um, typed these once. So uh, I'm just going to demonstrate these verbally and you can keep your eye down on the console. I'm going to add two to five, three, two, one. I'm going to subtract um, 15 from 10, three, two, one. You get negative five. I'm going to multiply six times 4.2, three, two, one. I'm going to divide 10 by four, three, two, one. I'm going to raise two to the power of three, three, two, one. And I'm going to raise nine to the power of one half. That's the same as square root three. And then the part that I wanted to show you, uh, there's some other examples here that you can um, try out yourself, but the it's the order of operation. There's a little um, clipboard symbol you can just click. Not that I want to teach you how to copy the code, but it, it might be fast if you want to follow along now. So uh, it says to try this. Now, uh, this is about the order of operation. We've told it to do two different operations. And the point of this is to demonstrate that um, R could choose to do sequential um, from left to right, four plus two, and then six times three. So it could do this calculation first, followed by the product of that calculation times three, but it doesn't. It has a priority. It prioritizes um, uh, multiplication and division over addition and subtraction, and then goes left to right after that. So three, two, one, and we do get the answer 10. So it's multiplied um, two times three first. We can explicitly um, use parentheses if we want to emphasize uh, certain calculations. So again, this is just like the order of operation when we learn maths on paper. Uh, so this should have the same outcome as before, three, two, one is 10, but if we shift the location of the parentheses, three, two, one, we get a different answer and it's performed the calculation four plus two first and then perform that. So parentheses have um, priority over um, multiplication and subtraction. So there's a little bit more on that page I'll leave for you to explore. I wanted to say something about the use of spaces in your R syntax. So uh, spaces don't matter at all. So on a single line, R will treat each of these operations as if the spaces didn't exist. So we have this example that shows a calculation with no spaces. Um, this shows an example where there are uneven spaces. There are a lot of spaces between the seven uh, and the minus, but no spaces between the minus and the five. Um, so uneven spacing, we could have large spaces. I think I had a much larger space, like ridiculously large on the same line between these. I've removed it just so that it fit on the slide, but um, it will ignore very large spaces. I think up to the maximum character limit uh, of our studio or or of, of R, whatever that may be today, <clears throat> like two, 256 spaces or something. Um, and then, you know, a way that we might prefer to write equations is uh, like this, 16 times three, where there's exactly one space and we're consistent with it. And probably that last example is the best style. In fact, um, this last example is the official R style and it is the official Google style for R, if you're uh, interested in that sort of thing. And now we're up to the Booleans. We mentioned that, and a few people have um, BODMAS. Um, you'd have to remind me what the acronym stands for, but um, 
Yes, it probably does. It follows the exact same order of operations as uh, other programming <laughs> languages. There are several acronyms, and I can't remember any of them. What does BODMAS stand for? <laughs> if you, there we go. <laughs> Brackets, orders, division, multiplication, addition, subtraction. Yes, it does. <laughs> That's the exact order of operation for it. Thank you. <clears throat> so Booleans. Now, um, this is the case where uh, we're getting values of true and false. And um, the thing with the butler, <laughs> no, no harm in uh, double checking with Google. Uh, a thing with uh, the passive aggressive butler in R is that it will interpret phrases that you uh, put in the, a line of code and uh, it will guess what you mean. So in uh, some computer programming languages, you have to define the uh, the type of variable for expressions or for uh, variables that you put in them explicitly. So you'd have to say a uh, variable containing the integer three was an integer or um, a variable that you wanted to be a decimal amount, a precise decimal amount like 3.1. Uh, you'd have to define it as a as a decimal number or as a float. Uh, so various languages, um, older languages, um, usually required that. I say older. That doesn't mean they're worse languages. That just means that uh, they require you to do that, and it makes them safer languages and possibly more accurate languages than some modern languages. But R doesn't do that. It's designed really to um, make it as easy as possible for people to get going and then kind of learn important details later. So uh, R will interpret this as a Boolean expression. Let's just try it out um, in, in code. So uh, we'll try out uh, the expression three greater than five. We know this is false. Look down in the console, three, two, one, and we see that it's, um, in, indeed recognized as a false statement. And this this whole expression is now assumed the value of a Boolean phrase, of a Boolean um, expression, and it takes on a certain value. Well, um, why do we care about that? Well, we can, we can exploit that, and we often do exploit that uh, to manipulate data. And I know it may be abstract to think about this now, but uh, if we make a, a, a bit of data, that uh, let's say is, um, I'm gonna use shorthand, the integers one to 10, I've just used the colon uh, to give us a whole um, expression from one to 10, three, two, one, we can just see that that is indeed what we, what we get. And if I ask in a Boolean expression, is three greater than that whole vector, um, what do you think will happen? Well, let me, let me explain what will happen. What will happen is that um, uh, the passive aggressive butler will will uh, execute a, a a boolean expression for each element of that vector of integers, and it will give us a true or false statement. So three, two, one, and we can see that uh, three is is um, is greater than one. It's true that three is greater than two. And then it's false that three is greater than all of the others, and uh, we can we can exploit that, and we will practice doing that to manipulate data to our ends. I don't think I I do I do have an example of that. <clears throat> so uh, we have something like this, where um, maybe we have a vector with a with a couple of numbers here, and uh, here we're going to put. Um, I'll just put those exact numbers to follow this um, example. So I'm going to make a variable called x in it. I'm going to um, put the um, numbers 21, 3, 5, 6, and 22. 21, 3, 5, 6, and 22. I'm just going to execute what's in x down in the console. 3, 2, 1. There we go. And then what we're going to do here is um, in brackets. We'll talk about this more in the future. This is just to demonstrate um, some of the useful tricks we can do with, with Booleans and why we might be interested in them. We're gonna pick out 
adjust the values where x is greater than 20 by using the Boolean expression x greater than 20. What this will do is it'll give us a, um, a true, false, 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 and a true. And in this bracket notation, we treat those, um, we treat uh, the numbers that are contained in the value x as uh, living, say, in little addresses in a vector. We'll go through this in, in a vector bootcamp uh, session in the future. But uh, if you can just imagine, we'll get a true a for 21, a false, a false, a false, and a true. And check out what happens. <clears throat> Three, two, one. It uh, it actually um, only indexes the values where we have a true. So it's a way to index and to slice variables. This is super useful, and we use it frankly all the time. Um, I, I I think it's hard to to uh, see that sometimes uh, early in the boot camp, but um, that's uh, what we're doing. Something weird is happening with my keyboard and my keyboard is going crazy. There we go. Okay, so um, back to the slides. We're running out of time a little bit today, but um, <clears throat> we're almost at the end. I think it's important that I say a few words about base R and tidyverse and why I think this is important to keep in mind. Yeah, thanks, Jimmick. Uh, the square brackets are all important, but we'll, we will practice that quite a bit in the next few weeks. So uh, these are quotes um, over here. Um, for some reason, I don't think I compiled my last version where I remember to put the quotes in, but they're the and and to attribute who said these quotes. These are quotes from a an a famous on the internet amongst statisticians, amongst people like me. Um, we might be able to see these quotes and, and recognize who wrote them and where they're from. And they're, they're quotes from a, an essay that um, someone called uh, Norman Matloff, uh, I'll just write his name since I forgot to ad attribute it. Um, Norm Matloff is a prominent statistician who um, was a professor at Stanford um, University. And I think also at uh, one of the other University of California uh, important universities. And he uh, was one of the early adopters and developers of, of our tools for, for the rest of us. He's also really well known as a good teacher of statistics and he's, he's very highly respected. And uh, some years ago now, maybe five or six or seven years ago, he wrote um, this essay that I've linked to so you can follow it. Now, th this version of his essay is not the original version he wrote, but it, it's been posted um, on the Posit website, the company that makes our studio. But his post was a little bit negative about the tidyverse, and the tidyverse was invented by the makers of our studio. And it, um, base R is the, just the language R. It was invented to, um, to enable non R users to to do everything and to perform very sophisticated s statistics with almost no training and they they designed it with best practice to make the language easy to use for beginners and uh, robust to to mistakes and um but also very powerful so you could you could learn and develop as a practitioner tidyverse is different um uh, from a coding perspective, some of the peculiarities of the R language, um, it, it could be accused are, are kind of weird. Um, some of the things that the passive less aggressive Butler allows you to do in the, in the code can lead to mistakes. And so tidyverse um, creates a lot of very programmatic rules and, and a lot of utilities for you to use. And my personal opinion on this is that um, I want to like tidyverse, but I tend not to use it because it, to use it, you have to load a lot of packages that I just find unnecessary almost all the time. And I also find that uh, when I'm using it just for my personal self, that uh, it requires sometimes to do the same thing, a little more code for the tidyverse solutions than it does 
regular old R code. And so I, I personally do prefer base R, but I also observed that base R is a bit easier to start using right away for beginners. Here's what Norman Matloff said is that R is rapidly devolving, note the word devolving, not evolving, into two mutually unintelligible dialects. So uh, you, you write R code, and if you're an expert in tidyverse, you might not recognize that it's the same language or doing the same thing. And uh, he says that he, uh, he's, a, he's a famous um, statistician and a famous R programmer. Um, I, as a seasoned R programmer, that's a bit of an understatement, cannot read tidy code. Um, there, there are some other people um, that sort of blew up and said, oh, I'm glad somebody finally said it. And there were some other people at the time that blew up and said, oh, my God, I can't believe you just said that because tidy's worth, tidyverse is better, as everyone knows. So it became like a, in the statistics world, quite a controversial one. Each has its own merits, I think. Um, but here's a warning. It makes it harder if you're, if you're learning to find uh, the solution for one single thing, because often you'll Google to find a solution and you don't know whether the solution you're being given is in tidyverse or base R. So it does make it a little bit harder to find the solution. If you want to, you can read about it. Uh, and then that brings us to the exercises. We are just about out of time, but if we go down to the, um, <clears throat> to the exercises. They're just at the bottom of every page. There's a navigation pane on the right. I've got this kind of uh, um, the font very large so that people can, can read it easier in the uh, video. But uh, if I make it a little bit bigger, at the bottom of every one of these are some practice exercises. And um, the, the point of these is not to pose challenging questions. Um, the point, the way I've designed the bootcamp pages is to go through and uh, if you've, especially if you've done the code yourself, uh, I will give examples of concepts and in the practice exercises almost all the time, I've asked you to uh, demonstrate the same concepts I've just taken you through, maybe with some small variations. And maybe as they progress, there are some that are more difficult that require you to use the help menu or maybe to synthesize and put together concepts from uh, within the page or maybe even from different pages. But um, so the the first one, I, I recommend everybody to formally answer these in comments in your script. Some, some of them rarely are um, conceptual like this. Name and describe the purposes of the first two sections that should be present in every R script. And I'll just say verbally, uh, quickly talking you through these you should always have a header and a table of contents, um, and which we talked about. What is the purpose of the subset argument in the box plot function? Hint, use help. What I intend you to do is to use the function help, help bracket, box plot, close bracket, and look up the argument called subset is what I intend you to do there. So just using the, R, the help menu like we did. 6.3, write an expression using good R spacing syntax, one space between operators that takes the sum of 3, 6, and 12 and divides it by 25. So you'll need to use brackets to get the order of operations correct there. 6.4, use pseudocode steps for calculating the volume of a cylinder. Okay, so um, a hint, if you do, do not know the volume of a cylinder, calculation by heart, you may need to uh, search the equation. I believe it's the circumference of a circle multiplied by the height. And the circumference of a circle is 2 times pi times r, the radius, times the height. So uh, give the cylinder height 3.2 and the radius of 5.5. Um, and I asked to report the volume in centimeters, cubic centimeters, to two decimal points, okay? And, and I also instruct use three decimal points of accuracy for pi. And pi, I hint, is uh, a standard variable in R. So we can just kind of see that real quick. Having some kind of issue with my um, 
my keyboard. I don't know what it is. So if we just type pi and submit it, um, the default value is the first uh, six decimal values of pi. So I ask you, really, this question is not to get the answer so much as writing the pseudocode steps for how you would do this. Uh, and then I ask you for this one to execute the following code and explain the outcome in comments. So this is a complex Boolean expression. It's uh, true, which is a Boolean value. We submit true by itself, three, two, one. It just comes out as true. But if we uh, say uh, use the and expression, we can start to build up more and more complex logical phrases. So it's uh, true and three less than five. So three less than five is also true. Uh, and six greater than two, that's also true. And the exclamation point, as I explained in a part that I didn't say in the slides, is the opposite. It's um, the opposite of false. The opposite of false is true. So this expression is true and true and true and true, three, two, one. And four trues make a true. So uh, the idea is to play with it. And I highly recommend, uh, this is a top tip that I'll demonstrate in a lot of the weekly labs is to, if you find a whole expression difficult to understand, just select part of it and run it just to understand the part that, um, that uh, one part at a time. So you can break down large expressions. And then the last one is the same question for every, for every page is to write your own plausible practice question involving the use of the not Boolean operator the exclamation point. So write your own practice question that uses the, the not operator as a Boolean. So we, that brings us to the end. We're over time a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>